Hello, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us tonight for our bog, bugs and lab notes, learning from the world around our session. We have some exciting guests tonight that I can't wait to introduce you to. I'm Meg, and I'm your host, and this is my co-host. Hi, everybody. I'm Qing Lan. I'm really looking forward to tonight's show, and I've already got my pint ready. Hope you guys will enjoy tonight's show as much as I will. Yeah, I've also got my pint ready, but it's water. Beer will come later. So we've come a long way from the first Pint of Science Festival in 2013, and we really wish we could have this event in person. But one benefit of watching online is that this session will be available on the Pint of Science UK YouTube channel after this event ends. So if you loved your talk, you can go back and rewatch it later. During the event, please feel free to ask any questions to our live hosting speakers by typing Oh, it's backwards in the chat. Any questions that we can't get to right away will be saved to answer later. Now, if you are curious about the team that put this event together, this is where you can say hello to the 2021 Pint of Science team from Exeter. And if you're curious about the event's Pint of Science, this link will also tell you more about the annual event. You can also get some Pint of Science merch for your daily dose of water. Banks of Science is a nonprofit organization and all purchases and donations will help us bring you these shows every year. Now, before we get started, I'm wondering, what are you most excited for tonight? Oh, so for me, I really want to hear some weird stories like Peatland. Are they fun? Like, what do you find? What can you find in a book? And oh, about James, who knows that ants know how to schedule time and manage time. And plus, I've got so many questions that I want to ask Amy, like what she's doing every day after work. Does she even sleep or she's just a mad scientist that worked like a machine? And what about you, Meg? So we've kind of gotten a little preview of the talks and they're going to be amazing. But because I'm not a real scientist, I think I'm most excited to hear what Amy has to say about scientists because I have a hard time putting myself in the science category even though I am studying sustainability science. So I think I'm really excited to hear what she has to say about that. Speaking of questions, is there a question that you're hoping to get an answer to for tonight? I really want to know like how the scientists actually come into their research field, like Borg's land and ants plus computer science. How did they come into that? And plus, like, what are their motivations to doing these things? And what about your questions, Meg? I think I'm most interested in hearing if our next speaker has ever found a bulk body, because I am fascinated about that. So now we are going to jump in with our first guest of the evening, Dr. Kirsten Lees. She has an undergraduate degree in geography from the University of Durham and did her master's in polar science at Cambridge. And she has also earned her PhD from University of Reading in environmental science. And her current role is a postdoctoral researcher role at the University of Exeter, focusing on, on ecosystem resilience, specifically on peatlands, which brings us to our talk on the bog, a guided tour of peatland science. How fantastic. I'm not really sure if you got that pun, but if you have any science related puns, please feel free to share in the chat. And with that being said, let's please welcome Dr. Lise to the stage. Thank you. Well, the title that I've given my talk today is On the Bog, uh, because that's where I spend an awful lot of my time and I really wanted to tell you about it. Bogs are, of course, a type of peatland. Well, what is a peatland? The key thing about peatlands is that they are really wet environments. Places which have an annual rainfall of over a metre are ideal places for peatlands to grow and to thrive. So at this point, you'll probably be thinking, Kirsten, if you could pick any ecosystem in the world to study, why on earth did you pick these wet peatlands? Why didn't you pick tropical beaches or somewhere like that? And I have to admit, when I'm thigh deep in a bog pool doing field work, I do sometimes ask myself that question as well. But peatlands are pretty amazing places. The fact that they are so wet means that they have some pretty cool flora and fauna. 
And one of the most specialised plants on a bog is sphagnum moss. Now, this is some dry sphagnum moss. When this stuff is wet, it can hold 20 times its own weight in water. I did wonder about demonstrating that for you tonight by getting some wet sphagnum and squeezing it out into a bucket. Uh, but then I remember that I'm presenting this on my laptop and the laptop uh, plus a bucket of water uh, is probably a bad idea, particularly if I start getting pints involved later. But yes, sphagnum is usually full of water. If you've ever been out hiking on the moors, on Dartmoor, for instance, and you've stepped in a patch of squashy green vegetation and got a boot full of water, well, that was probably sphagnum moss. Now, when I say the word bog, you've probably got an image in your head of what that looks like. It's probably wet, it might be difficult to walk through. If you're Scottish or you've spent much time in Scotland, it's probably populated by clouds of midges. And to be fair, you're not wrong about any of that. Peatlands do have all those things. For most of the last few hundred years, peatlands have been seen as unpleasant places. They've been seen as wastelands, dangerous places outside the borders of civilization. A classic example of this is in the book Lorna Doon. Uh, at the end of that book, it's set on Exmoor, and at the end of it, the villain sinks into a bog and is never seen again. Sorry, that's uh, maybe that's a spoiler alert, but um, it was published 150 years ago. <laughs> so peatlands are very much a Marmite landscape. You either love them or hate them. Through history, people have loved them and people have hated them. Peatlands are also brown and sticky and full of organic matter, just like Marmite. I really wouldn't advise spreading peat on your toast though. So during history, people have tried to make these wastelands productive, either by draining them for agriculture or by digging them up for fuel or for compost. It's only really in the last few decades that we've started to realise how useful peatlands are in their natural state. Why is that? Well, one of the ways peatlands are useful is for limiting flooding. In its natural state, a peatland covered in sphagnum moss will hold water and release it slowly. But when we dig those drainage ditches in peatland, we're essentially turning the bog into a drainage board, just like the one next to your kitchen sink. And when it rains, all the water runs down those channels into the rivers really, really fast. It overwhelms our systems and it causes flooding. If we leave the peatland in its natural state, it can help to prevent that from happening. Another way that peatlands are useful is because they store huge amounts of carbon. Current estimates suggest that peatlands store as much carbon as all the world's forests, and they hold onto it for thousands of years. And the reason that peatlands can do that so well is because, again, they are so wet. In a forest, when a tree is growing, it's taking up a lot of carbon over its lifetime but then the tree dies and it crashes to the forest floor and all the little microorganisms get to work and the decomposition process is started. And during that process, the carbon in the tree is turned back into CO2 and it's released back into the atmosphere. Now, those microorganisms, just like you or me, need oxygen to function. So expecting decomposition to happen normally in a wet peatland is like expecting you to do your job normally at the bottom of a swimming pool. Unless you're a diving instructor, in which case just ignore that analogy entirely. The point is that in a healthy peatland, the waterlogged conditions limit decomposition, meaning that the carbon isn't released back into the atmosphere, but instead builds up in the peat layer upon layer upon layer. Now, peat grows at a rate of about one millimetre per year. In some areas, peatlands can be up to 10 metres deep. So peatlands are super useful. But the problem is many peatlands are in a bad way at the moment because of what we've done to them. Our historical drainage of peatlands or pollution or overgrazing, all of that combined has really damaged many of our peatland areas. Some peatlands are even still being dug up for compost. 
I did a back of the envelope calculation and figured out that the amount of carbon in four bags of peat compost is roughly the same amount of carbon that's emitted from driving between London and Birmingham. But not only does digging this peat up for compost release the stored carbon, it also, of course, destroys the ecosystem, stopping it from taking in any more carbon in the future. Now, in some areas, groups of people are restoring the peatland, trying to turn back the clock from that damage. And the ways they're doing that are by blocking up those old drainage ditches, increasing the water levels and stopping decomposition. In places where the peatland is bare and the vegetation is gone, they're planting sphagnum moss. But we need to know a couple of things about this. Firstly, do these methods of peatland restoration work? Are they stopping flooding? Are they holding in the carbon? And secondly, where are they most needed? And this is where my work specifically comes in. I study peatlands from space. I mean, not literally. You can probably tell I'm not in zero gravity right now. I make a terrible astronaut. So it's really lucky for me that I can get data from space, from satellites, without leaving my home. I can simply get those images onto my computer. Traditional scientific methods, which involve going to the peatland and physically taking measurements on the ground, are really, really useful. I'm not saying we should stop using those methods, but sometimes it's helpful to be able to look at things on a larger scale, to see the bigger picture. It's like if you're doing a jigsaw puzzle. Traditional on the ground science can tell you a lot, is a bit like looking at um, some of the puzzle pieces in a really detailed way. And that can tell you a lot. It can tell you what the jigsaw is made of, whether it's wooden or cardboard, or whether the design is hand painted or printed, or in the case of one really difficult puzzle I did during lockdown, whether it's holographic. Those are things you might not be able to tell just by looking at the outside of the box. But the box can show you what the puzzle is actually of, the big picture, if you like. If you just looked at this puzzle piece, or maybe a few puzzle pieces like it, you might think that the puzzle is entirely green. And then it's only when you look at the picture on the box that you see that, yes, some areas are green, but other areas are orange or pink or whatever. In the same way, satellite data can really help to give us that big picture. It can show us which areas of the puzzle are green and which are orange. Or to put it a different way, which areas of the peatland are healthy and which are not. And it can also show us how that changes over time. So how does it actually work? Well, there are lots of different kinds of satellites. Some satellites, optical satellites, are like big cameras in space. They basically take photos of the Earth from above, but with a few extra wavelengths. So you can have red and green and blue images, like from your regular camera, but you also get some extra wavelengths, like near infrared thrown in, which can give you even more information about exactly what's happening on the ground. Other satellites use different types of signal. You might remember studying the electromagnetic spectrum at school, or you might not remember, depending on how much attention you were paying at the time. Um, but some satellites use wavelengths on the longer end of that spectrum in the radio or microwave areas. Those satellites send a signal to the Earth and it bounces back and returns to the satellite to give us information about the surface. Now, that information can be things like how rough the surface is, which can tell us about vegetation, or um, how wet the surface is. It can even give us information about whether the surface is moving. So what have I learned from using these methods and for putting them into practice? Well, I've already mentioned that the two key ways or two of the key ways of telling how healthy a peatland is are how wet it is and what the vegetation is doing. That's why restoration nearly always involves blocking drains and re-wetting. And it sometimes involves planting sphagnum as well. So I can use optical satellite imagery to look at what the vegetation is doing and radar data to look at how wet the surface is. And I can bring those two together using those and many other techniques as well can give us really, really valuable information about where restoration is most needed 
and how successful it is. Oops, I'm too nervous and too excited, so forget to unmute myself. But that's a wonderful talk. Who knows about that peatland can save our planet in that way? I don't know about you guys, but I think I'm definitely going to put some wellies on and visit some peatlands in my next vacation. Now I think it's time to ask some questions. Ah, so quick, we got first question from Jonathan Campbell. Are there any particular important peat bog sites in the UK? Yeah, so there are loads of really important peat bog sites in the UK. Um, I mean, the closest one to here in Exeter is Dartmoor. Um, but a lot of the peatlands in England particularly have had a lot of damage. There are some really important, um, more near natural sites uh, in Scotland and in Wales as well. And the flow country in Scotland is uh, one of the largest areas of blanket bog, which is a particular type of peatland uh, in the world. So, so the flow country in Scotland is, uh, is one that I'm particularly fond of. It's where I did my PhD and it's, it's very important as well. Thank you. Second question from Jenny Wetley. Hope I pronounce your name right, correctly. Why haven't we banned peat compost yet? <laughs> Good question. We are getting that. I think um, one of the problems with uh, peat compost is, is finding an alternative that people are happy with and that has a reliable supply chain. Um, but we are we are moving in that direction, thankfully. Okay, Jonathan Campbell asks, are there any oh, sorry, species of UK animals that are found only or predominantly in peatland bogs? That's something that's not really my area of expertise completely. Um, I know there are there are a lot of species of birds which definitely favour peatland environments. Um, there's a lot of bird watching opportunities in peatland. Uh, there's also, I think, um, unusual species of insects. I had a friend who was uh, doing her PhD on on uh, beetles in peatland environments. So again. Lots of things that are fascinating, but I know next to nothing about. <laughs> okay, Phil Bell Young asks, is it just peat bogs that release greenhouse gases or is it any time soil is dug up and unearthed? Peatlands are a special case because they have so much organic material. Um, so because of the way that peatland is it sort of created, um, with that layers and layers of organic material building up, um, the organic matter content is really, really high. So most soils are have very low organic matter. They're, they're mostly kind of sands and, and clays and things like that. Um, whereas peatlands, the organic matter is incredibly high. And that means there's so much more potential for greenhouse gases to be released. Um, and of course, there's also the whole issue of being wet and being waterlogged and it's that that is preventing them oxidizing uh, so the minute you take the peat out of that wet environment and dry it out that's really when the problems start that's really cool and i hope we'll... ah my favorite <laughs> question coming up have you ever stumbled across a bop buddy I knew you were going to ask this. No, I haven't. And to be honest, I've got no idea what I would do if I did. I'd probably scream. <laughs> okay, John, I think I again. Oh, you live in Pope, Scotland. That's nice. You can visit there. Then, then he asked what makes a blanket box special. Okay, so um, different peatlands get their water in different ways. So blanket bog is rain fed. It doesn't have much ground water. Um, it's, it's, and it, it lies on the ground like a blanket. That's why it's called a blanket bog. Uh, so you can have hills and mountains and, and the bog will just kind of lie across the top of it uh, and take its water from the rainfall. Yeah, that sounds something really different. Um, have we got any more questions? Fire on boys and girls now. Phil Bellian asks again, I used to volunteer digging bogs for conservation. Good for you. Do projects like this to restore or protect bogs still exist? Um, well, I talked a little bit about peatland restoration. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what's meant by digging bogs for conservation. Uh, it could mean creating peat dams in the old drainage ditches or potentially something like that. Um, in which case, yes, that kind of thing 
is still very much going on. Um, a lot of peatlands in the UK are currently being restored. Uh, and I mentioned in my talk a few ways that that's done. Uh, but one of the main things is by, by blocking those drainage ditches and raising the water tables. There are also, I'm pretty sure there are volunteer groups that go out and plant little, little plugs of sphagnum moss as well, which can then grow into big clumps of sphagnum moss over several years. Yeah, I think all the matters is just volunteering and help do everything you can to keep our planet running as it is. Now it seems like we are running out of time with our Dr. Lee, so please ask more questions and hear over from her Twitter. And um, Meg, would you like to bring in our next guest? Hi, thank you. Oh my gosh, that was so interesting. Thank you for answering the question about bog bodies. I just really wanted to know, as previously mentioned, if you wanted to connect with Dr. Lee's or had any more questions after the event, make sure to find her over at her Twitter. Now, we are going to welcome our next guest onto the stage, James. He has a background in mathematics with degrees in engineering mathematics and discrete mathematics but a gradual move over to the applied side has found him pursuing a computer science PhD in the field of optimization. For us who may not know who that is, including myself, it includes um, programming computers to use math techniques to solve very large problems. And his topic today is how insects have helped him with university timetabling. Can you believe it? Anyone catch that pun? Please put more puns in the chat. We really, we are really enjoying them. Now, please take it away, James. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you for everybody who's come along to watch tonight as well. So um, I'm really enjoying the puns. Keep those coming, please. So um, I'm just going to start by giving a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. So I'll begin by uh, giving a gentle introduction to optimization, which is the field that I'm working in. And then uh, I'll introduce some ants and uh, we'll find out a little bit about what it is they do. And then I'll bring all of this back to timetabling, which is actually the project that I'm working on at the moment. OK, so what is optimization? Um, well, there are many different types of optimization, but uh, in a very simplified, broad sense, uh, we have a problem. And optimization is finding a solution that gives the best outcome possible. And I say possible because often there are limitations or constraints about what we can do. Now, um, as I said, in the very broadest sense, an optimization problem usually involves trying to maximize something or minimize something. So that's the value or particular values of different things. And you don't have to be working in optimization to actually be involved in it because it's something that as human beings, we're all doing every day, consciously and subconsciously. Whether that's trying to find the best outfit for a night out or trying to find the best parking space, for example. So I'll give you another silly example. Let's say you're, you've gone out and you want to buy a present for somebody, a bar of chocolate, and you've gone into a shop and because you're a generous kind of person, you want to find the most expensive bar of chocolate in the shop. So that is your target to maximize. So how would you do that? Well, let's say you were faced with something like this, okay? And the price labels are on the back. Um, very simply, in this case, you could simply pick up the bars, look at the price labels, and then take the highest one, okay? Problem solved. That wasn't difficult. Um, and in the field, that's actually called a complete enumeration because what you've been able to do is assess every single possible outcome and pick the best one, the optimum. Um, however, in real life optimization problems, normally we don't have that luxury because they're too big or they're too complex. I mean, what if you were faced with something like this? Thousands of chocolate bars in a massive shop spread over multiple floors. And we have to assume here that you can't simply ask someone, look at the stock list. Um, so what are you gonna do? You can't look at every single product and pick the best one. Chances are you're not gonna have time, okay? So it's, it's not practical. Uh, so what you're gonna have to do is find some kind of compromise where you say, okay, I'm not going to go for the most expensive one in the shop, but I'm going to settle for something that is mm, satisfactory. And you're going to have to come up with some strategies about how to do that as well. There's a number you could pick. 
you could, for instance, set a time limit. You could look at random prices for five minutes and then say, OK, I'll take the most expensive one I found so far. You could also set a cost threshold. Uh, keep looking at random prices uh, until you find one that exceeds, say, 10 pounds and then take that one. It's another valid strategy. Or you might notice that there's some kind of pattern to the arrangement of the products in the shop. Uh, they might be arranged by shelf. So one shelf might have cheaper bars than another one, in which case you could uh, look at a couple from one shelf, come to the conclusion that, OK, this is too cheap. I'm going to move to the other shelf and keep jumping around the store like that. Now, those strategies are actually all examples of optimization algorithms. And an algorithm is simply a set of instructions to follow. Now, it turns out that computers are very good at following sets of instructions. So we can program a computer to do this kind of thing. And as I said, we are doing those things as well as humans. But we're not the only creature in the natural world that does this. And a very notable example is ants. And ants are fascinating because they exhibit a collective intelligence behavior. I'm just going to talk a little bit about how they do that. So. Uh, ants are just as interested uh, in chocolate bars as we humans are, of course. So let's say we have this situation where we have an ant colony here on the left. This is their home where they live. And then somebody's dropped a little piece of chocolate over here on the right. And then in the middle, we might have some natural obstacles, for example, a lake or something like that, which the ants can't cross. Now, what happens in the beginning, because they just moved house, okay, so they don't know the, the environment here. They're new to this area. So the ants will go out and explore, and they will all head off in random directions. And as they do that, they deposit a chemical on the ground as they go, which is known as a pheromone. And I shaded the pheromone in green here so you can see. Now, over time, eventually, one or more of the ants is going to, by chance, come across this piece of chocolate. And when they do, they can take a little piece of it and retrace their steps, take it back to the colony. Now, if these ants are laying down pheromone chemical at a constant rate, then the shorter paths are going to see a larger amount of footfall and therefore a larger amount of pheromone. And the subsequent ants, when they head out, they tend to be attracted to areas of higher pheromone concentration. So essentially, they follow their sense of smell. Now, you'll notice that this path is shorter than the one below. So it gets, it gets greener, it gets smellier, essentially. And eventually what happens is, as if by magic, uh, all of the ants, or most of them, end up following this shorter path. And therefore, they have found the most efficient path and minimize that distance. Now, now, hang on. What, what on earth has all of this got to do with uh, timetabling? I hear you ask. So I will come round to that right now. Now, timetabling for universities is the project that I'm working on. And um, again, to simplify that, essentially what that means is we want to assign lectures to rooms and time periods in order to generate a workable timetable for a university. OK, so what are we actually optimizing in this case? Well, it, it's not cost, like the chocolate shop example. It's not distance, like the ant example. In this case, it's something a little bit more abstract, and that is goodness, the goodness of the timetable. OK, so what makes a timetable good? Well, let's say that we had a timetable where there are lots of uh, clashes and students can't attend the classes they need to, or we have lots of double booked rooms and things of that nature. Clearly, that's not a very good timetable. So we can create a scale from very bad to very good, and we can score the timetable on that scale. And that is the number which we're trying to optimize. OK, so first question, then, can we completely enumerate? In other words, can we simply generate every single possible timetable and then pick the best one, like with the small chocolate example. OK, well, let, let, let's do a little bit of um, very rough uh, back of the envelope maths here and find out. OK, so let's say we had uh, eight hours in a day and five days in a week. That would give us a total of 40 time periods over the week. And we're optimizing for, for a very trivially small university example, which only has 10 rooms, let's say. And we want to place 100 lectures. 
Well, if you do the maths, that is 400 to the power of 100, which is approximately equal to 10 to the power 260. OK, so that number is a one with 260 zeros on the end. Uh, so as you can see, it's getting very, very big very quickly. And just as a comparison, it's estimated there are around 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe. OK, so it's it's very clear from this that uh, with all the computers in the universe, we couldn't possibly do this. It's completely impractical. And so the short answer is no, we can't completely enumerate. So this is where we take some inspiration from the ants. I told you I'd, I'd get back to that eventually. OK, so please don't be too afraid of this diagram. I will try to explain it. So what we have here is a 3D grid with lectures along this side periods from top to bottom and rooms from back to front. So each little cube in this diagram represents the placing of a lecture in a period and a room. So in this diagram, we have all the possible timetables for this very, very small example. Now we're going to draw some analogies here and you have to think a little bit abstract here, but essentially we're going to send these ants not on a journey from their home to a bar of chocolate, but we're going to send them on a route, a path through this timetable. I should point out this is all virtual. We're not putting real ants into the computer because that would be no good for anybody. So this is all virtual, all happening within the processor. OK, so we send this ant through and at each layer, each lecture layer, it visits exactly one cube. So it's placing a lecture to a room and a period. So by the time it's got to the very end here, it has actually constructed a complete timetable. OK, that, that's great. So we have this timetable. Now, remember, we're not optimizing distance. We're optimizing score. So when we have the timetable, we can have a look at it, have a look where it's good, where it's bad, give it a score. And if it happens to be a good timetable that we like, then we can lay down some virtual pheromone on the cubes that the ant visited. OK, so these are shaded in green just as before. And the more ants visit those pheromones because they become attracted to them, just like before, the greener they become. And over time, what you'll find is very quickly, actually, and very impressively, in my opinion, the, the ants will converge to a timetable that is satisfactory. And, and there are some other little tricks we can employ as well. For example, if uh, we want to model the, the lake that we had before, we want to say that a, a lecture placing is out of bounds, we can simply color that red and that will tell the ants, well, don't visit this particular block because this is out of bounds. So for instance, it might be that um, this period in this room is when they do the cleaning. So we can't put the lecture in there. And that actually helps speed things up because it reduces the amount of possible moves that an ant can make. So that is, that is essentially, in a nutshell, how it works. And, and we send these ants in one after another, and we gradually, the longer this computer program runs, the better the timetable that gets returned. And that is essentially how we can be inspired by the natural behavior of ants to create timetables. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions or puns that you may have. Thank you, James, for this fascinating talk. I'm always surprised how much more we can learn from the nature and seems like we already got the first question. Phil Bellian again, thank you for asking. Is this behavior also seen in other social insects such as bees or is it unique to ants? That, that's a very good question, yes. Um, it is in fact observed in, in a number of insect species and, and what you find when you work in optimization um, uh, in, in the in the world of computer sciences, there are lots of these algorithms, lots of these approaches that are actually inspired by various natural creatures. And um, there's an artificial bee colony algorithm. I believe there's one for, for termites as well. Um, and then there's even one for cats and larger animals. There's a, a flock of birds algorithm. Last week I attended a talk where there was a, a school of fish and, and Pretty much, if you can think of a living creature, there's there's an optimization algorithm based on it. So, yeah. Oh, OK. Another question. What other everyday human problems do you think need optimizing the most? Well, um, what, what you see in, in the timetabling problem, um, it's what we call a discrete mathematical problem because it deals with uh, 
discrete um, separable entities, which, which are whole numbers, in other words. And there's a whole range of problems that kind of fall under that category. And for example, uh, vehicle routing. If you have a fleet of vehicles and you have a delivery force and you need to schedule where your trucks are going at a certain time, that's a big one. Um, and that, there's all sorts of things. I, I also mentioned sort of dating apps and things. Now that we have this, this world of big data where we're able to leverage information, um, yeah, we can, um, you see these apps optimizing uh, couples and partnerships and, and so on. So, yeah, there's no end to, uh, of things that can be optimized in the human world. Okay, thank you. I wonder what turtles can help us solve. Anyway, um, Phil Bellian again. Are antisocial bugs like beetles, for example, also able to exhibit these behaviors or are they less intelligent because they aren't social? That that's an interesting question. I'm not an entomologist, so I'm I, <laughs> discussing the behaviour of insects. I'd probably draw the line at ants, to be honest with you. But um, yes, yeah, so I imagine that um, there there are probably things that um, all these algorithms are kind of abstractions of what natural creatures do. So I imagine even if uh, beetles and and other I suppose well if spiders, for example, are not necessarily social uh, creatures and even though they don't behave like ants, I'm sure that there is things that we can learn from them and draw these abstractions to make optimization algorithms. So, yeah, I'm not the expert on that, but. <laughs> OK, Pinky Purple Galaxy asks, I like the name, by the way, what animals would be the worst examples for optimization? Very interesting. Again, um, I. Yes, I suppose it would have to be uh, animals which are, well, <laughs> antisocial animals. As I say, most of these uh, algorithms tend to come from animals that work in, in groups uh, or swarms or pods or schools or whatever it may be. So, yeah, if, if you can think of an animal that's, um, well, the first, a lone wolf, perhaps, if you can think of any animal that operates as a loner, um, I guess that'll be your answer, yeah. Okay, Johan, who asked? Have you used this optimization efforts for anything in your personal life? Kitchen layout, commute to the office, maybe? Yeah, good question again. Um, actually, I, I have to say the reason why I got into doing this PhD and pursuing this line of research actually did come from a real world problem, which was to do with, uh, I was working in a bar and uh, we had to schedule a number of members of staff to be on, on uh, duty at all times. And, um, we wanted to make sure that they got the appropriate length of breaks and things of that nature. So there were all these constraints going into it. And uh, for some reason, someone asked me to, to, to try and optimize that, which I did. And then I, I got thinking about it. And that's what uh, led me to doing this PhD. So, so, yeah, these things are not just abstract. They work in the real world and they're very helpful. Yeah, hopefully. Jonathan Campbell asks, so on the second run, is the end more likely to go through the timetable, which has the fro, sorry about, I'm trying to pronounce that, pheromonis <laughs> dropped on it? <laughs> Wouldn't that mean these are biased towards the first acceptable timetable reached? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. And essentially, um, you, you call it a bias towards the, the first acceptable timetable. Um, that, that bias, as you put it, is, is what we want, actually, a lot of the time, because we're, we're trying to converge. But remember that um, these, are all, these are all different probabilities. So the ant can choose uh, alternative paths. It's not, it's not guaranteed to follow the, uh, the path of the first acceptable timetable. So it, it can diverge. And the idea is that we we put a lot of ants into this every iteration. And, and so the more we put, the more uh, exploratory behavior, we call it. So in the same way that we saw the ants walking off at random to explore different paths and look for uh, other, because you're right, there may be better timetables embedded in there, or there may be bigger pieces of chocolate elsewhere. So we do need to retain that exploratory behavior as well as the exploitative behavior of the best timetables. and. Um, involved in the coding of that is trying to find a balance between those two things. So yeah, good question. Thank you everybody for asking so many questions. Seems like we are still running out of time with James. Now James will aim to answer them in the comments. And by the way, Dr. Lee is also with us. So drop down your questions in the chat box. I think they will try to answer all of your questions as much as they can. And I think we are both feeling a bit tired, aren't we? So Meg, how do you think about a little break?
You know, I think that is a really great idea. We're going to take a couple minutes to stretch our legs for a break. So before we do, our next guest is Amy Filsbury. We all have an image in our heads of what a real scientist looks like, you know, with the white lab coat. But does that really represent what a career in science looks like? Amy will answer any questions that you might have. So during the break, please feel free to think up any questions during the break and type it. I keep pointing at the wrong one. <laughs> type it into the chat and we will see you in about three minutes. Welcome back. I hope you had a really lovely break. I see some really exciting questions coming in already. So our next guest is Amy. She's going to answer questions on what makes a scientist. And she has a master's in marine science and has worked in the field for 10 years. Right now, she's working on FICO Me X UK, which is a pr project converting problematic seaweed blooms into useful products, including plastics, fertilizers, and biofuels. And she really enjoys science communication and works to share research with the wider community. Now, take it away. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Nice to nice to speak to you all. But um, hopefully we've got some really exciting questions coming up. So I'll do my best to get through as many as we can. OK. Hi, everyone. I'm back asking questions on behalf of you guys. First one, Jonathan Campbell again. What would you like? What would you think are the pros and cons for working as a scientist in academia versus industry? Okay, so we probably started with quite a hard question there because I think it's really dependent on what you want to get out of science because obviously everybody's different. Some scientists love to work in academia, some scientists equally would love to work in the industry. So I guess it's totally dependent on, on your individual personality. Um, I guess I'm quite a strange one because I do a bit of both actually. So I, I quite enjoy 
uh, you know, academia and writing papers and that kind of thing, and obviously doing the research that I'm interested in doing. Um, but then also a lot of my work is uh, to do with putting things out into industry as well and working with different um, people. So I guess, I, I don't know, it's, it's quite a difficult question. Industry, I think, probably is the one of the best pros, I think, is that you get to work with people from all over the world. You know, you'll be working on different things with different people that think differently as well. Um, whereas academia, maybe, you know, you're with a lot of like-minded people, which isn't necessarily a con either. So, yeah, it's a bit of a, a broad question, that one. Thank you. And Emily Mora asks, hopefully I pronounced the name right, uh, what it's like to be a woman working in science and what advice would you have for anyone, particularly the woman, who would like, would like to work in a STEM field? Yeah, so this is a really good question. I like this question. Um, and I was actually writing about this today. So actually, good timing as well, Emily, uh, on your question. Um, so I, as a woman working in science, I mean, I don't find it personally particularly biased. Um, but I know in terms of stats that women are definitely less likely to be within the science field. It's definitely a male dominated field, um, although it is improving. So hopefully we'll continue to get there. Um, and yeah, I guess in terms of advice, there's, there's nothing you can't do. So, you know, you can do exactly the same things that men can do. You would go through all the same routes. Um, and a lot of the time I actually work with uh, children and encourage them into STEM um, from an earlier age as well. So actually there's quite a few things, you know, I, I'd say probably talk to people is a really good way to start. So see if you can find any women scientists out there talk to them, see how they got into science, um, you know, contact me. I'm more than happy to talk to you about how I got, I got into science. Yeah, I also work in STEM, so we are like stick together, gal. Yeah. <laughs> Yuhan, who asked then how does your life as a scientist compare with how you imagined it is as a child? Oh, that's a very good question. So I would say as a child, my typical view of uh, being a scientist was probably being in a lab, which I am quite a lot of the time. Um, also, as a marine scientist, obviously being in the field as well, um, which I guess is why a lot of people get into sciences because they want to be out in the field doing whatever research they enjoy. Um, and that one I, I, I managed to do quite a lot. I know a lot of people sometimes get kind of stuck in the office. Um, so I'd say it's, it's pretty well aligned with what I thought personally as a child. That's a good one. And yeah. the other one asked, how could more people, including those without qualifications, support science and research? Yeah, so this is, again, a really interesting one. So obviously we need people to support science. It's really important that people support science, but also trust science as well. Um, obviously, with ongoing events, we've seen things that we obviously need people to trust science and that it works. Um, and I would kind of say definitely try and look out for things. So if you see a news story about something that sparks your interest, maybe go and have a closer look, do a bit of research yourself and see if there's anything more you can find out. Um, also, keep an eye out for any actions you can take. So particularly with it regards to the environment, there's lots of things obviously we can do to help. Um, and that that is, you know, everybody can do something to help the environment. So definitely there's things out there you can look for um, in that. And also, I guess if you were interested in doing some actual science yourself with science, with scientists, um, the thing to look out for is something called citizen science. So I'm sure you can you can Google that and uh, find out. Uh, and there's normally loads of different projects going on uh, with scientists asking for the public's help in whatever aspect of research that might be. So it could be collecting water samples from your local area and sending them to a certain person for whatever purpose. So yeah, definitely have a look at citizen science. Yeah, I really don't think it helps. Jonathan Kemper yeah. again. Um, what's your favorite thing about working in marine science yeah. that's a good question because it's an easy one to answer um so yeah i mean i obviously just love the marine world and working in marine science it's great because i get to go out and enjoy the sea which is what i would do in my spare time anyway so it's quite nice that i get to do that in my day-to-day -day job as well um, and also, I think it's really, really cool to work within marine science because I'm so interested in it. I have those connections and I can 
kind of find out information and work with people that are like-minded and I get to find out all the cool research that's going on so yeah I love working in marine science and Zhu Qingli asked, what's your favourite marine species? Oh, that's oh, such so a cute. difficult question. Um, <laughs> what do I like? Probably, okay, this is a very uh, niche, <laughs> very niche uh, animal, but I really like groupers. So they're, um, they're a type of fish, obviously. Uh, they can be really, really big, so you can get huge, huge, huge um, groupers, or you can get nice little groupers um so yeah there's there's a couple that i like but they've got very characterful faces i would say oh so many species it's hard to yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> jenny wetley asked do you think the reduction in opportunities to do field work at secondary school been deter sorry about my english okay. detrimental to people wanting to purpose science as a career I, I wouldn't say it would be detrimental. Obviously, it's it's different, um, but I wouldn't say it's detrimental because you're you're getting the same knowledge. Um, obviously, practical experience is a big part of science, and it, it depends what what field you're in. Um, but yeah, I don't think it reduces the opportunities for people, um, especially as it's you know across the board. So you know, I don't think it does reduce opportunities, and also. Thinking back through my career, no one's particularly asked me whether I could like, you know, do an evaporation or something like that. Obviously, it helps. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I am a firm believer in practical science. So I think it definitely helps, but I definitely don't think it reduces the opportunities. Yeah, thank you. And Krista asks, what has been the most unexpected unexpected thing you have ever experienced in science? Oh, that's a very hard question to answer. Can't think of anything off the top of my head. I think one of the things in, in my field that I've um, experienced is how unpredictable science can be. So you might go into something thinking, it's definitely going to be this. I'm sure that this is going to be the answer. And then it can be totally different to what you think. So I think that's one of the, the interesting things. So, for example, I grow a lot of um, microalgae. So I have lots of columns growing, all sorts of things. Um, yeah, and they always surprise me because I think, oh, they're growing fantastically. And then the next day I go in and there's nothing there anymore and all the water's gone all murky and clear. And yeah, so I think we never can know everything about science. And I think it's really interesting when things don't go the way that you thought they were going to go. Yeah, it seems like science is all about unexpected. So, you have who asked, what's your biggest peeve about public or media perceptions of science? Okay. Scientists? I can answer this one because today I actually um, was looking at, and if you haven't already looked at it, it's actually a really great place to look, is there's um, a report that's done every four years um, about public attitudes to science. And I was reading through the latest one, which was 2019, and uh, it actually asks, um, it kind of does a survey of, of people, and they were asked words that they would use to describe scientists. And the ones that kind of stood out were things like serious. Um, and, you know, I can see why scientists are perceived as serious, but the scientists I know are definitely not serious. <laughs> half the time and a lot of scientists are just normal people um you know that obviously have to do some some serious work so i think that's definitely one of the the ones that i saw i'm trying to remember some of the other words that were on there now but i can't remember them all but definitely go and have a look uh they're on the government website really easy to find public attitudes to science yeah great down so jonathan catbow again good to see you asking so many nice questions what are some cool examples of your research intersecting with other fields like within science and beyond so i guess one of the things that i'm really keen on which i suppose intersects with uh, with other fields is is like communicating science so i guess it is more with to do with the education sector sector um but what i've done a lot of is working with 
other fields in terms of like drama or arts or you know performance and those kind of things to actually communicate science to the public because those kind of things are really engaging you know like 46 percent of people learn the majority of their science from television so it's i think working outside of just scientists is really important to be able to share our research so yeah there's loads of cool cool festivals and things that um, are out there and again happy to talk to anyone i won't mention them all now but yeah documentaries and tv shows our favorite yeah and oh. felicity bernard asked what would you say is the best way to engage people in science again our, my personal belief and this is going way uh, uh, away from the serious scientists i think the best way to engage people is to have fun uh, i think having fun is a really good leveler you know even if you're the most serious scientist in the world you will still have a laugh and a joke even if that's a science joke so i think there's some really um good things to be said about having fun in science and getting people involved. Thank you, Amy. Good okay. answers. Yeah, I think everything is about having fun, even in science. We are crazy people. I love you guys. <laughs> yeah. And are we expecting more questions? Well, there's something I would like to know, like, oh, someone just dropped then look, Pillsbury asks, what is the first thing we can individually do to benefit the ocean environment? Well, I mean, I guess the one that you'll all be aware of uh, and is a really good example is plastic pollution. So it's definitely been out in the media really heavily. Um, and it's actually really great when things like that happen and it gets promoted a lot because it means that the funding is put kind of more into that field. So there's definitely a lot of research going into plastic pollution at the moment and what we can do to prevent that. So I guess individually, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle is the, is the typical thing. But yeah, anything you can do to reduce the amount of plastic that you're using um, or find alternatives to is definitely something everybody can do. Even if it's one thing a day, it helps. Indeed just helps everything you can okay it seems like we're running out of the time again oh time flies how <laughs> have more questions for emmy feel free to ask her on her twitter down there hoping i'm pointing it right <laughs> and uh, now thank you amy i really enjoy the show and it's approaching nine so sadly i think we all have to bring meg back and give us some finishing talk right Yes, thank you so much. So behind the scenes, we have loved some of these puns. So we wanted to wrap up the evening with the little giggles. So we really loved Phil. Would love to come up with the pun, but he is too bowed down at the moment. Same, same. And Jonathan said, oh, he wished he thought of that pun earlier, but it'd be bad for him to repeat it. If you listen to the ball talk, you'll definitely get that. And Phil coming in strong with another really funny one. He's so sorry he had to leave the event. He had to sort his radiator out. It was leaking cool amps everywhere. Behind the scenes, I was cracking up. I had tears coming down my eyes. Thank you so much for those giggles. And he says, unbelievable. That's a good one as well. I tried really to do one. bee puns. Um, I, I think today's National Bee Day or something. So I feel like the timing on these puns are absolutely excellent. But unfortunately, I mean, if you have more puns, please feel free to put them in the chat so I we can laugh about them later. But unfortunately, we have to wrap this up for the evening. And thank you so much for watching. And we hope you had a really great time with bugs, bugs, and lab coats learning from the world around us, organized by the team at the University of Exeter. And I want to take the time to thank our amazing team for putting this together. They worked so hard to make it run smoothly. And thank you so much to our amazing guest speakers. Your talks were absolutely phenomenal. They, it's just awesome. And thank you to you. Thank you for coming to join us tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed the talk. But if you kind of really didn't like it or you have any suggestions 
for improvements, make sure to keep your eye on emails for a feedback form. If you fill out that feedback form, you'll be entered to, into a prize draw to win some kind of science merch. I mean, who doesn't like free stuff? I love getting free stuff. And if you're curious about the team behind today's show, you can check us out at this website down below. And as well, if you love today's session and you want to learn more about the events, pints of science or snacks and merchandise, please check out this link as well below. And that is all we have for you tonight. Thank you so much for coming and enjoy your evening. Thank you.